and grow YouTube show. So why don't we go over general basic rubber plant care? Um, do we want to start with water? Sure, we can start. We can start with watering. Um, so watering. So I, I have actually have a funny, not a funny story, kind of a kind of a sad story. And I don't know what your thoughts are about moisture meters. Okay. Uh, I am. I'm not a proponent of moisture meters. I'm not saying don't use one. You just have to be careful. And I, I had a friend reach out to me and she said, oh, my rubber plant's suffering and it looks really bad. Can you help me with it? I said, sure. And anytime anyone reaches out to me, I always tell them, please send me a picture. Yeah. Please send me a picture. And I can, I can tell um, oftentimes from the picture what's going on. And so she told me, she told me she uses, I asked, well, how do you water? She said, well, I, I, I use a moisture meter and it's indicating that it's fine and that the, the, the potting mix is so moist. And I said, okay. And I said, when was the last time you watered? And she said, it was a few months ago. Mm. And I said, oh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying every single moisture meter is faulty, but there are so many junky ones. And my, my best recommendation, I, I know this is, I'm segueing into different topics, but they're all related. When we're talking about watering, your finger is seriously your best friend. Touch, <laughs> seriously, touch, touch your potting mix. It needs to dry out sufficiently. Always, always water thoroughly, always have a drainage hole. And I use my finger to determine how, how dry, you know, the potting mix has gotten. So if you have, if you have a small pot, let's say a four inch pot, I would maybe let the top half inch or so to dry out before watering it again thoroughly. If you have a much bigger pot, so the, my, my rubber plant that is probably nine feet tall right now, it's in, it's in a big 15 inch. Um, yeah, the, the diameter of the pot is about 15 inches. And for that size pot, you can wait, you can wait for it, you know, a lot more of it to dry out. So I let at least the top quarter of, of, of the soil to dry out before, before watering it again. Um, that being the top said, quarter inch or the top quarter of the whole pot of the whole pot. Okay. Of the whole pot. And so, you know, I, I, I don't measure it out with a ruler or anything like that. I just stick my finger in there. And so, you know, the top two or three inches I'll, I'll let dry out before mm -hmm. I, I actually water it again. And then you're giving it like a very thorough water. And then a very thorough watering all, mm -hmm. all on the surface. And no, you know, normally I wait until a tiny bit comes out of, of the drainage holes and then I stop. Mm -hmm. um, if, if too much of it collects, I'll, you know, especially for a giant pot, what I like to do is I take out my turkey baster. I don't know if you've done this before. And I suck out all the water. I have a dedicated turkey baster that I use. That's so funny. That's so water. clever. I've never done that before to pull the water out of the saucer. Yes, if it's too big to move. Yeah, that's um, very clever because you're not supposed yep. to leave it after, you know, you can leave it for like 12 hours or whatever to allow for capillary action. But then after you got to be sucking that out. Yes, otherwise your soil will stay, you know, much too wet. And then, you know, that can cause issues. Down the line. Yeah, that's so clever. So, okay, so we're, so these are drought, drought tolerant plants. We're letting them dry out pretty thoroughly and then pretty giving them thoroughly. a good water again. But not completely. I would recommend not letting your soil dry out completely. Okay. Because, or for, especially for too long, it's okay if they dry out completely. Just don't wait too long. Otherwise, you can have leaves dropping. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can have your lower leaves turning yellow and brown and falling off. That that mm -hmm. can be caused by. I know we'll get to that later on when we talk about issues with, um, you know, problems with with, with uh, related to the rubber plant. But they are. A little, you know, drought tolerant to some extent. Just don't wait. Don't wait too long after it's completely dried out. Yeah, I'm very sensitive about trying experimenting with drought tolerant right drought tolerance right now because I went through a phase where I underwatered some plants, thinking that I was letting them go through drought, and their roots shriveled up, and then the plant is has been in terrible condition because. I let that soil dry out so dramatically. So yes. there's, these are all learning opportunities. You know, you, oh, you sway, absolutely. 
sway on the pendulum. But um, yeah, I, th- I thought that was really interesting. So let's talk about light because light is always such a such a huge thing yes. for, for plant parents. Oh my gosh. Okay, so for a rubber plant, at um, just as a general rule of thumb, put it in front of a window. I don't care what window you have indoors okay. because indoors so you you've traveled you were just in costa rica right and you mm-hmm. said you saw rubber plants growing out in in direct you know, sunlight direct in direct sunlight yeah if they're growing if you see if you witness a plant growing in direct in full sunlight outside that means indoors you cannot overdo it mm-hmm. our light indoors is so much less intense than it is outside mm-hmm. and so you cannot overdo light for your rubber plant indoors, just given it, it's just, it, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and I, I talk about that in my, in my book as well. I, in my chapter on light that there isn't nearly as much light indoors as we, as we think there is just by virtue of the, of the fact that we're inside, just by the light going through the window, it automatically gets reduced tremendously. And then the further you get from the window, it dramatically drops off. So pick a window, any window for your rubber plant. Preferably you want a window that has some direct sun. So if you have, um, you know, an Eastern facing window that gets morning sun, that's beautiful. If you have a Western facing window gets afternoon sun, that's great. If you live in the Northern hemisphere and you have a Southern window, those uh, unobstructed Southern window, those tend to get a ton of direct sun. Mm -hmm. That's great too. And a north window, you know, in, in the northern hemisphere doesn't get any direct sun. That's fine. Um, but and you should have it right in front of it, not off to the side, not two feet below, right in front of it, because mm. that makes a huge difference. And, you know, I mentioned the hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, north and south is reversed, which I right. thought I which I thought that was really interesting. Um, now, when it comes to water. I'm going to tie this into water because this is things, things work together that way. Mm -hmm. Right. When it comes to water, the more light you have, the quicker your soil is going to dry out because your plants going to be growing more. Mm -hmm. So if you have plenty of sun, then you have to monitor, monitor your plant a lot more frequently because it's going to dry out, dry out more. Yeah. More quickly, I should say. It's a great point. I will also say, I think I'll make a radical statement right now, but I think in general, people overestimate how much light that they have indoors. And I'm a great example of that. When I started caring for plants, when I started Bloom and Grow Radio, I was a total novice, really learning all of these concepts as I was interviewing people. I learned, oh, I have Southern facing windows. That's amazing. I have the best type of light. And I had unobstructed Southern, Southern facing windows. It was fantastic. My plants were very happy. But what I didn't realize was how drastically that light gets reduced foot after foot away from my window. And all of my windows were on one side of my apartment. So I was putting plants in almost no light, thinking that I was putting them in medium light or bright indirect light because there was Mm -hmm. enough light to visibly like have have the room lit during the day. But the volume of light reaching those plants wasn't nearly enough. Absolutely. For anyone listening who hasn't, I have a free download on my website called Understanding Natural Light. And it's actually the process that I did to learn this lesson. <laughs> um, and you I basically, you track your light with a light meter for a few days and I kind of walk you through it. Yes. But yeah, I think in general, even if you've got those huge, you know, Southern facing windows that I had, once you get six inches from that big window, you're still in that medium, medium light area, you know, it drops off d- dramatically. I actually have, you'll, you'll like this since you, you brought up your, um, your light experiment in my light chapter in my book, I, I have a graph showing off, showing how quickly it, the light decays. Oh, that's amazing. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's uh, remarkable when you look at that science. It really is. It mm-hmm. really is. And it's, it is opening. And I, I, I know you brought up the fact, the term low light, um, oftentimes rubber plants are labeled as low light plants, but they, they are not, they are not. Yeah, and just like you, the snake plant. Just like the snake plant. And I, I you know, I, the, the, in fact, those are the two examples that I often use um, when, when describing, you know, low light plants. And, but 
they're just going to, they're going to look sad over time. Mm -hmm. They're going to look sad over time. Rubber plants are not low light plants. Um, they, they can tolerate it. They can tolerate it if your other conditions are okay, but they will do much better for you. They will grow so much more quickly if you give them plenty of, of light. And I don't think you can overdo light for these plants indoors. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And you know, you could put them in your low light scenario, but it's not going to grow if you want that growth. Right. Yes. What about soil? So you talked about, you know, letting the soil dry, uh, get me medium dry esque. Uh, what do you recommend for soil? I mean, any, any well draining soil will do. And there's a lot of different combinations and it all depends on, you know, the conditions that you have for, for my rubber plant that I have now, when I repotted it, I think it was probably five years ago at, at this point, I, I didn't measure everything specifically. Um, but it's mainly, I started off with an all-purpose potting mix. I probably used miracle Grow, um, And then I added some perlite and a little bit of orchid bark as well. And it drains beautifully. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't sit on top. As soon as you start, as soon as I start watering it, it, it gets absorbed right away. Um, in general, I, I would say starting off maybe three parts of, you know, your favorite all-purpose potting mix and then mixing in one part perlite. I think that's a great starting point. Mm -hmm. And you can add all the other stuff if you want. If you want to add orchid bark, that's fine too. Um, but just be careful that you can overdo. You can overdo adding all these different things. Yeah. So the, the chunkier, the chunkier you make your potting mix, the more frequently you're going to have to water. And I recently, um, someone emailed me through my through my blog asking a question about his Monstera deliciosa. And he said, oh, this was so beautiful. And, you know, I, it had several leaves. It was beautiful when I got it. And I, it lost several leaves. They all turned yellow. And he said, I, I'm afraid I'm killing it. How can I help it? And I said, can you send me a picture? So he sent me a picture. And when I took a, took a look at it, it said everything that I, that I needed to know. It looked like his plant was planted in, his Monstera was planted in mostly orchid bark. And I said, how often are you watering? And I'm not a fan of strict watering schedules, which I can touch on that in a second too. Uh, but he said, oh, probably every, every 10 days to two weeks. And I said, given that, you know, it's mostly orchid bark, that your plant probably is completely desiccated and drying out. And you, you want a balance between moisture retention and drainage. Totally. That's interesting. You bring that up first off, shout out to Espoma organic. They're, they're one of my sponsors and I love using their potting mix and then mixing some of their orchid bark. That's like been my new little thing that I do, but I will say, um, oftentimes I recently, I got a, my first anthurium crystallinum. So I ended up putting some more orchid bark than I normally would, because I thought, I am going to overwater this thing. Cause I'm going to be helicopter plant parenting. And sometimes <laughs> I feel like if you're going to overlove something, if you're someone who wants to water super frequently, that's kind yes. of a hack you could do to kind of encourage that, but also realize, you know, the, the organic matter in the potting mix is important. So you can't just be putting it in, you know, perlite. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I feel you like that making your own soil mix is so popular now, but it's, too, there is a too chunky for sure. Yes, absolutely. Unless you said, unless you like to water every two or three days, which right. if you do go ahead and do it, but I, I don't, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to water too frequently. <laughs> 